Mr. Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Confederation of Finnish Industries and uh, of the Finnish Institute of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, International Affairs, excuse me, I have the great honor and pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, as you can see from the houseful of guests we have today, uh, the topic is very timely. Uh, we are all here to listen to your introductory remarks regarding how to move forward with the European Union and the common currency. Uh, I believe that all of us in this room share uh, a concern. Uh, the concern is wide uh, among uh, the uh, business community uh, and uh, we, are, we are concerned that we don't have enough growth in Europe, we would like to move back to creating jobs and generally uh, get order in the house. Few people in Europe seem to have the guts and the vision to move forward forcefully. The concern of this confederation uh, is that decision making is slow and insufficient and Europe is losing competitiveness. We have the privilege today to have with us a person who is very well uh, prepared to speak <coughs> to us on this uh, topic. Uh, Prime Minister Monti, as I believe you all know, served as a commissioner uh, between, two, between 1995 and 2004 uh, in, in uh, first uh, in on international markets and services, and later on competition policy. He has served uh, as uh, Prime Minister of Italy since uh, <coughs> November 2011, and his government uh, has been introducing reforms to combat the current crisis. Uh, Prime Minister Monti is no, is, is, knows Finland well. He last visited here in 2010, uh, and he has been a, visit, a guest also to this building before. Prime Minister Monti, again, very welcome uh, to this event, and I would like to leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I am very grateful indeed to the uh, Confederation of Finnish Industries and to the uh, Institute of International uh, Affairs for this joint invitation. Um, I have uh, a personal history of participating to European events which uh, has exactly the same age as uh, Finland because uh, I became a member of the European Commission in Brussels, in Brussels the first time in January 1995, the very day when Finland became a member of the European Union. And uh, I've been since following uh, for 10 years in my official capacity as commissioner, but also <coughs> in, uh, in a private capacity later, and now again in an official but national capacity the huge contribution, much greater that, uh, than you may realize, that Finland <coughs> has been giving and gives to the European Union. A contribution which is made up uh, of uh, strong and uh, consistent uh, defense of uh, the principles of a competitive open market economy. Um, 
also of uh, uh, taking care of uh, uh, social purposes and yet doing it in a way that is uh, uh, highly consistent with uh, the development of the economy. Um, and always I found Brussels is a wonderful position to compare the different behavior of different countries with a strong respect for the law, be it national law or European law. So in a sense, um, Finland has been a forerunner of what many years later we have found enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty namely that Europe should uh, strive to become a highly competitive social market economy. Finland has been and is being <coughs> such and shows a lot to others. Although it is very much for the others to discover themselves the virtues in Finland because uh, one of the features I always greatly admired in Finnish individual and collective personality is the modesty and the lack of aggressive promotion of oneself, except perhaps then in the commercial area, <laughs> which goes to the merit of the institutions hosting us this morning. <laughs> Uh, towards a joint uh, future for Europe. Well, I think the President mentioned that in his introductory remarks the key challenge. The key challenge is growth. The key challenge is growth. And growth will be needed both uh, for economic and social reasons in Europe, but also to keep uh, the consensus uh, uh, there and hopefully growing as to the further constructions of the European Union. And uh, uh, we are at a, an extremely delicate uh, moment in time. And by the way, uh, this is the reason why I asked uh, to visit uh, Finland uh, uh, at this very time. Um, we are all familiar with the crisis in the Eurozone and all the technical and economic uh, and legal complexities of it. Maybe we do not reflect enough, and I had the great opportunity yesterday of reflecting at length with the Finnish Prime Minister on this, on the fact that uh, the euro, which uh, was meant to be the culmination, the perfection in further integrating Europeans, uh, risks becoming a factor of disintegration of the Europeans, uh, not only for some uh, concrete reasons such as uh, the repatriation of many of the activities of uh, banks in Europe due to the uh, Eurozone crisis, but more fundamentally because uh, there is a, a risk, it seems to me, of this integration of mentalities, of growing divergences among the psychologies of European citizens, a tendency towards the resurgence of some prejudices or, or stereotypes in a continent where each of us works in a competitive and a cooperative way to improve, to be better. Uh, it is as if uh, the old phantoms uh, uh, of uh, European mutual skepticism uh, are gaining ground, which I think would be exactly the opposite of what European integration and the single currency were there to foster. That is why I believe it is so important not only to make all the progress that uh, the 27 or 17 member states are uh, trying to achieve in Brussels and in the national capitals, but I think it is also important for the political leaders to uh, take upon themselves 
the responsibility of uh, um, reconciling the, um, the spirit of their citizens with the European project, but also the spirit of their citizens uh, with the, the uh, features of other parts of Europe. Um, I see, for example, in my country, which has traditionally been one of the most uh, pro-European um, countries, I see in the last uh, few months a dangerous tendency uh, in the public opinion, in Parliament, to uh, reconsider critically uh, the European Union, the Eurozone, some very large uh, um, countries uh, normally located at the north of Italy because it's also difficult to be a European country located at the south of Italy and uh, um, uh, and uh, also because of this reason my government consistently uh, makes a point of never <coughs> telling Italian citizens we have to contain the budget, we have to do this or that structural reform causing pain in the short term because the EU asks us to do that. We always make a point of explaining that we have to do that because it is in the interest of our children and grandchildren. And by the way, Europe asks us to do so. But it would be very, very dangerous to internalize the merits and externalize the blame. Now, um, with this uh, more psychological note, uh, but very important one in my view, uh, in the background, uh, I think that a lot of work is going on in the European Council and in the various councils, and of course in the European Parliament, uh, at the European Commission, in national parliaments yesterday, I had the privilege of visiting the national parliament, which is uh, the most uh, frequently quoted in discussions uh, uh, at uh, the European Council, because uh, no country more than Finland uh, makes references to uh, the constraints put in the democratic process by the national parliament on the margins for maneuver of the government of Finland at the European Council. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, we have to work uh, for growth through greater integration and here I'm glad to say there is a 100% coincidence of views between the, the Finnish government and the Italian government. Um, uh, both Prime Minister Katainen and I signed uh, a few months ago uh, a letter with some colleagues uh, in view of the European Council of March uh, calling for a much deeper and much more seriously taken development of the European single market, uh, certainly in terms of which parts of the market need to be more developed uh, and here of course, the digital agenda comes very first, and we know the contribution that this country has been given culturally and technically to the development of this in Europe and in the world, but also in terms of tougher enforcement of the rules for the single market. And I have been for 10 years in charge of uh, ensuring enforcement of rules for the single market first, then for competition and state aid control. And I think nothing is more important, again, not only economically and legally, but also psychologically, than showing to all European citizens that there is a watchdog out there in Brussels which ensures the compliance with the rules irrespective of size or power of countries and of degree of uh, seniority in joining the European Union. I think this is a very fundamental point. And this is, by the way, the reason why we in the Commission in 2004 
after the um, um, the uh, decision of the ECOFIN Council to close one and a half eyes when uh, Germany and France uh, violated the Stability and Growth Pact uh, and the Commission proposed the appropriate warnings but the Council did not follow the Commission proposals whereas it had done so with relation to Ireland and Portugal one year earlier we in the Commission took the unusual measure of deferring the Council to the European Court of Justice uh, because respect of the rules is uh, even more important, I would say, than uh, macroeconomic uh, circumstances uh, that might have perhaps provided an excuse at that time for the two largest countries not to restrict their economies too much. But the, the equal treatment, I believe, I know how much uh, Finnish society is, uh, is uh, uh, keen on this principle, is of paramount uh, importance. We believe, uh, Finland and we, that uh, uh, much of the growth uh, that the European economy still has to put in place can be derived uh, by uh, through a, a deepening of the single market uh, in all its different dimensions, including the development of uh, um, cross-border um, interconnections in uh, uh, energy, uh, ICT, and uh, uh, transport. Uh, then, of course, one has to have uh, the Economic and Monetary Union uh, revisited. Uh, it is the topic of the day, given also the fact that, uh, if I understand well, there is a meeting of the governing board of the ECB uh, in Frankfurt today. Uh, but in a longer term perspective, we need to bring uh, more solidity from the point of view of all countries to EMU. And uh, uh, this is a necessary complement, uh, I mean, the credibility of Economic and Monetary Union is a necessary complement to the development of the single market if we want sustainable growth to be created in Europe. And uh, I am aware that Italy is among the countries that uh, have been observed with uh, keen uh, and uh, often skeptical interest uh, uh, by many in Europe and in the world. And uh, uh, I'd like just to say a couple of words on this. Uh, when uh, I was asked uh, to form uh, a new Italian government last November, after the resignation of Prime Minister Berlusconi, and at the, in, in the midst of a, a financial crisis that uh, risked making of Italy uh, a new big fire for the whole of the Eurozone, uh, we concentrated our efforts um, on uh, uh, the objectives of achieving uh, budgetary discipline and of achieving structural reforms to give uh, more competitiveness to the uh, economy. Um, and we have been doing so with uh, the strange uh, the, the support of a strange majority composed of three main parties, a centre-right party, a centre party and a centre-left party, which in the previous years had uh, barely talked to each other. And they found uh, uh, themselves uh, uh, still continuing for many months not to talk to each other, but uh, uh, being asked to provide votes in Parliament to support uh, what in fact is the largest majority ever in European Republican, uh, in Italian Republican uh, history. And with this majority, guided by a government uh, composed of no professional politician, which in principle is of course a big limitation, uh, but on the other hand can 
um, have the government be bolder in uh, proposing and enacting measures because it will not look for votes at the next election with this uh, strange formula we have been achieving quite a lot in eight and a half months. The uh, budget deficit this year is going to be 2% of GDP, uh, which uh, I believe in, uh, makes Italy in the EU uh, the, fourth, uh, um, the fourth best place after uh, Finland, uh, Luxembourg and Germany and the deficit will be one half of the average deficit of the EU, uh, which has 4%. And next year we are on course to achieve a surplus, a tiny surplus in structural terms. Uh, we have introduced a pension reform, uh, not negotiated with the unions, uh, and which uh, has generated only three hours of strike in December, uh, and uh, which is considered by pension experts to be now the most advanced uh, model of pension reform, inclu including the increase of retirement age to 67, and uh, the indexing of that age, retirement age, to future developments in the uh, life expectancy of the population. We have introduced a labor market reform to increase uh, among other things, uh, uh, flexibility uh, and leaning a bit towards the flexicurity model of Northern Europe. Uh, we have introduced a huge package of liberalization from the removal of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, tariffs, uh, of agreements on fees for the, for the professional services to the total unbundling between gas generation and gas uh, transmission and distribution. And now we are in the concluding phases of a uh, thorough looking and somewhat uh, blood generating spending cut for uh, spending review for the central administration and all the peripheral administrations. We uh, we, uh, week after week, we gain uh, praise by the various international organizations, the Commission in the first place, uh, and we are delighted of that. Uh, but uh, uh, so far, with the exception of, two, of the first two months of this year, we are not gaining praise by the financial markets. And this is a very topical <coughs> issue, namely the behavior of the, the interest rate spreads in the financial market. Um, we have one of the most uh, solid public finance uh, uh, positions in Europe now. Of course, we have a very large inherited uh, stock of debt relative to GDP, which is submitted now to the rigor of the uh, fiscal compact rules. Uh, but in terms of current behavior and future planned behavior, uh, we um, would have expected the financial markets to be uh, those very markets which unfortunately went to sleep for nine or ten years after the inception of the euro and allowed many disequilibria to be generated in the illusion that there was no quality distinction among the various sovereign bonds. All of a sudden, those markets three years ago uh, well, did wake up and now seem to be, as uh, Prime Minister Katainen uh, said yesterday, seem to be uh, unable to properly reflect uh, the progress made by individual countries in their economic policy making. So one of the topics for discussion these days in European circles is precisely how to remedy to that malfunctioning of the Eurozone which consists in uh, the uh, fact that uh, countries uh, complying with uh, all the uh, rules and directives of the EU uh, fail to have this reflected in a recognition by the markets. And uh, 
it uh, is clear to many observers that uh, at this point, this is not so much a, a problem caused by the individual country, but it is a problem linked to the uh, lack of uh, total trust in the integrity of the euro and in the management of the eurozone. That is why we are all working together on one hand to improve the uh, trustworthiness of policies conducted in highly indebted from the past countries and on the other hand to improve the mechanisms for the Eurozone. I decided to ask to be received in Finland uh, yesterday and today precisely because I think it is my duty not only to ask a lot of Italians in their own interest but also in the interest of the uh, stability of the Eurozone. And it is also my duty to explain to other European countries, uh, particularly those uh, geographically so far away and which may have a different vision of the world, um, what are the um, potential and the problems uh, faced uh, by a country like Italy in this uh, uh, context and I believe that uh, it uh, will be possible by acting together to dispel misconceptions. For example, I think that for a normal fi uh, Finnish citizen, uh, if uh, he hears of debtor countries in Europe, uh, I believe many of them would, would automatically place Italy in the category of a debtor country, after all, is so almost down there in Africa. It's not far away from uh, uh, Greece, uh, Portugal. It's so much more to the south of Ireland, which nevertheless had problems. As I mentioned, Spain, where I go this afternoon. And so Italy must be a debtor country. Now, the fact is that Italy is a debtor country to itself because it has a huge public sector deficit. It also has, as a counterpart, one of the highest private savings ratio and uh, financial uh, wealth uh, held by Italian citizens, which cover much of the domestic debt. And in terms of the debt incurred with uh, the rescuing institutions of Europe, uh, the debt of Italy is zero euro. We did not ask, uh, and we did not obtain, not having asked uh, any support under any of the existing facilities. We are the third largest contributor to the EU budget, and we are the third largest uh, contributor in terms of commitments to rescue Ireland, Greece, and Portugal, and the Spanish banking system. Uh, but if we calculate this on a net basis, we come e even closer to the absolute figures for Germany and France. Why? Because, of course, due to their economic size, Germany and France put up uh, committed amounts for Greece and the others higher than Italy did, somewhat higher. But everybody knows that part of this uh, came back uh, by, uh, by the way of the <coughs> relief to the German and French banks, which were highly exposed vis-a-vis -vis Greece. The Italian banks not having this uh, huge exposure vis-a-vis -vis Greece, the, the net and the gross in the case of Italy coincide. So this is just to show that there is sometimes a gap between perceptions and realities, and uh, I think we have to work all together on uh, uh, acquiring a deep and uh, correct uh, knowledge of each other's situation and be sure that down there in Italy uh, we look and the government uses very much the example of Finland to stimulate efforts for uh, 
fiscal soundness, for uh, compliance with the tax rules. Uh, if we were a political government, we would have been, uh, become highly unpopular in Italy because we brought the fight against tax evasion to unprecedented degrees of intensity and visibility. And uh, so uh, I will bring back to Italy uh, new inspiration and encouragement by from, from, from this visit to uh, Finland. And I realize uh, I must have uh, spoken much more than the time allocated to me. Thank you very much for your attention. Prime Minister Monti, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me just first uh, thank Prime Minister Monti for his comprehensive analysis of the state of affairs in, in the EU as well as in Italy. Uh, thank you for your willingness to, to address this, this seminar. We are, we are very grateful for that. I will make a couple of observations about the political implications of the European economic and, and financial crisis. I will argue that a major repair is needed in the political union in order to avoid a negative turn <coughs> in the entire European project, project of European integration. I think it's alarming that the economic and financial crisis is polarizing opinions on the need and usefulness of itself the European Union and the common currency throughout Europe, as we just heard from Prime Minister Monti. This uh, phenomenon is particularly alarming as crises and phenomena that can be perceived as common threats, challenges to Europe, have used to have a unifying effect this far. The crisis has clearly implied a return into a nationalistic setting in Europe, it has driven the various EU members against each other by emphasizing differences in economic structures and conditions. In this setting, I think the big picture, comprising joint risks and possibilities, interdependencies and joint responsibilities, has remained in the shadow of the talk dominated by national perspectives and interests. In my view, the domi dominance of national perspectives in the management of the crisis itself is itself a symptom of something, and it is this something that has to be repaired before it destroys the whole European project. Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that one of the lessons learned from the economic crisis is that the EU's powers in economic and fiscal policies need to be strengthened. This has already implied a stronger use of those competencies that the treaties already pro provide. Uh, the six-pack legislation can be mentioned as, as one example. Along with the establishment of financial stability mechanisms that has already taken place. As Prime Minister mentioned, there is debate about the establishment of a, a, of a European budgetary authority or an extension of the powers or the role of the European Central Bank uh, currently going on. Uh, so many things in the year, many things uh, that already have been done in order to strengthen the EU's powers in this field. I think that in order to provide a solid and legitimate uh, ground for this stronger role taken by the European Union, the democratic mechanisms must urgently be consolidated at the European level, and this is my, my main message today. The directions of European economic policies need a firm democratic anchoring, and this cannot be done at the national level only, through national parliaments, through national elections. Europe must be steered more from a European perspective, through a European level political debate, the construction of political alternatives, 
and an, an open political competition between these alternatives in a democratic process. Currently, I think uh, we all know the reasons for this, but the current EU mandate in economic policy is all too ambiguous. The, the state of affairs is that the, the competence belongs to the member states and the, and the EU uh, has above all a, a coordinating role. And the methods of, of preparing the, the EU's policies uh, as a result of this uh, remain highly undemocratic. So I would uh, call uh, for a, a more appropriate and up-to-date division of power between the EU and its member states in economic and fiscal policies. That must be the first step in this process. The EU's competence must be confirmed by the treaties. It must be entirely transparent and well justified with respect to the structures of global economy. The use of these, uh, this competence, uh, that is the directions of the EU's economic and fiscal policies, must be subordinated to European elections, as we do in, in, in nation states today. The body that leads this policy at the EU level must be a political body with the necessary political and democratic mandate. And now I'm talking about the European Commission that is the leading body in uh, exerting these powers. The Commission must uh, get rid of its bureaucratic and technocratic outlook. It must be returned to the road which the original treaties in the 50s once marked for it. The Commission must become the true political government of Europe, whose composition and political program reflects the result of European elections. This, ladies and gentlemen, would bring the required would bring in the required political dimension to the EMU. We no, now talk about uh, about this, the need of a, a, a political union, the strengthening of the political union. It would contribute to the role of the EMU as a true economic and monetary union. It would make the relations of political accountability clear at the European level and make the alternatives for the EU's economic policy visible and to be considered uh, by the European peoples. It's not a, a, a small step, it's, it's of course a, a major change, but many things to that direction have already been, been done, steps taken. Uh, but after all, this change, well, if, if we would bring in the true political dimension to EU, uh, this would help us uh, in, in, the, in the most serious challenge, challenge, with the most serious challenge that we are facing today. Because it would, this, would, it, this change would ensure that the game uh, of economic management, economic policy, is not being played by the various European governments and peoples against each other. It would all be about European political and economic future in the tightening global competition. Thank you. Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me also on behalf of the Confederation thank you Prime Minister Monti for your, your uh, remarks and uh, I would in particular like to thank you for your complimentary remarks uh, regarding Finland. Uh, for, from a business perspective, uh, we here believe strongly that there is no other way out of uh, the, the current uh, state of affairs than growth. We need to find a way for business to grow and create jobs in Europe in order to pay for uh, the, the debts uh, that Europe currently has. Uh, unfortunately, the, the prospects for growth in Europe today are sluggish. Uh, a bear zero, zero point um, something percent uh, this year, perhaps. Uh, a little bit more than one uh, for next year. When we combine that uh, with the news we had from the United States yesterday, uh, growth uh, uh, really uh, reasonably or very sluggish, and my concerns uh, that we might see uh, slowing uh, of growth in Asia, we have to get uh, put our act 
together here uh, in order to prepare for the measures that particularly Asia might take and uh, if we are not competitive enough we will have big difficulties. Uh, this is Europe where I am the vice, vice uh, chairman uh, visited uh, President uh, Barroso, President Van Rompuy and Vice President Rehn earlier this summer to deliver our message to them and I hope that we could get uh, the support from Italy also to these, these measures, measures. The first one uh, there was, uh, of course, safeguarding the euro. Uh, you, the euro has brought stability and predictability also to countries like Finland. This is something that the business community is well aware of, and, but it is a message where I think the, 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 the uh, big public needs to be better educated on. Uh, secondly, uh, we have to improve public finances exactly as you uh, lined out, uh, Prime Minister, and we have heard about the measures that Italy has taken. I have to say uh, in the capacity of chairman of this confederation that some of this, the measures that you listed here this morning are measures that we can only envy you on. Uh, the uh, public sector uh, growth has to be curbed also in this country. We have absolutely no right to point finger at countries uh, south of the Alps uh, with the developments that we have had here and still do. Thirdly, uh, we need uh, stronger measures to develop and open the single markets. And here again, I'd like to thank you for your support. Uh, Finland has been a supporter of uh, the digital single markets. We believe it's important. It has been estimated that it could, uh, could generate up to 4% additional growth in Europe if we could really see the digital single markets developed properly. The Finnish support uh, to the common currency has been questioned, and there is a reason to that. Uh, the, uh, the crisis has given room to, an enormous to enormous populistic rhetorics. There should be no mistake, however, the basic fundamental benefits of the co common currency have not disappeared. But the debt crisis has increased uncertainty. Therefore, we need speedy joint measures to solve the crisis so that the currency can be re-established for what it was meant for originally, to improve European competitiveness. In solving the, the, the crisis, all parties have their own roles, of course. The countries that have lived beyond their means uh, have to get there public finances in order, and we heard comments on that. Uh, in the structural reforms, I would like to see much braver measures, including fiscal measures, to support growth uh, among the, in, in, in the business community. The European policymaking culture needs a change. Policymakers need to recognize the central role of enterprises and entrepreneurs in creating jobs. The uh, comments uh, that you made in this respect were also very welcome. I'm afraid that too much energy uh, and too much uh, of the decisions we hear from Brussels lately have been more restricting growth and putting restrictions, uh, decreasing competitiveness of European industry. Perhaps, Mr. Prime Minister, these are elements where we, Finland and Italy, could work together uh, to bring back Europe to growth. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite the audience to, to take part in this discussion. There is a possibility to, to make questions to Prime Minister Monti. Why not to the rest of us, us as well? Uh, there are microphones uh, available. I would be happy to take a couple of questions and then give, give uh, the possibility to the Prime Minister to, to, to answer. 
I would like to start with the, perhaps Aleka for the day. Could you please yeah, introduce yourselves when you make the question? Uh, Alec Aldo, former ambassador to Rome. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, Italian industry has been, uh, has had many obstacles to growth now. One has been labor legislation, which has made life difficult for smaller companies to grow. And, and then you've had a system, let's say a culture in uh, larger companies, especially in the state sector, which has not been conducive always to good effective management. Um, so there has been, a, in a sense, a steady decline. How do you see the industrial future of, uh, uh, of Italy? And secondly, uh, if that future is positive, do you see that benefiting the south of Italy at all, or would it be uh, just concentrated to the north? Thank you. I think I'll take a question from Vesa Vitria as well. Yeah. Vesa Vitria from the Research Institute of Finnish Economy. Um, uh, Prime Minister, uh, debt neutralization has been at the center of the policy debate, in, both in uh, crisis management and in a longer term perspective. Now, of course, that would help those countries which are now currently under market pressure. On the other hand, it's quite obvious that uh, strong controls would be needed uh, on the behavior of indi individual countries in that case. And uh, like the Germans put it, we need a political union before we can have uh, a fiscal union. Uh, what do you think would be the necessary minimum uh, steps in that regard, basically on the road which the illegal and outlined for uh, debt mutualization, euro bonds to be introduced? Uh, what sort of political decision making on economic policy would be, need, uh, would be needed uh, for that to happen? And uh, given that there are so many difficulties on this road, the uh, Council uh, of German Economic Experts have proposed uh, what is called debt redemption pact, which is a sort of temporary uh, or the long-term European solution attached with very strong uh, controls. What is your view of that uh, personally? What do you think it is a good idea or bad idea? And how realistic uh, do you think that it is? Yeah, Yes, uh, Petrus Arum, a member of the European Parliament. On the structural side, Mrs. Steele kind of summarized uh, the need for the basic elements of uh, success of the European integration, namely the political union and the, the strengthening of that. It would be very, very important, although very difficult, I understand, to hear some concrete steps in your mind, Mr. Prime Minister. How are we going to do that? The strengthening of the political union, that is the necessary precondition, precondition of uh, success of further European integration and not disintegration. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for all the questions which go to the core of some of the issues um, to the former uh, Finnish ambassador to Rome, uh, you correctly identified, I think, uh, some of the obstacles to uh, the growth of Italian companies. Uh, I would put among the obstacles also a feature which depends from the companies themselves, namely uh, the high personal, I'd say even physical attachment to the company by the founder, <coughs> the, the entrepreneur. We have had many brilliant uh, new companies, uh, very successful in the short term, but then facing problems when uh, the uh, uh, successive generation uh, came. Uh, with problems on how to reconcile um, family relationships and uh, smooth uh, management of a company, and also the uh, uh, each country has uh, 
typical features, uh, advantages and disadvantages that come with them. Certainly, uh, Italians and Italian entrepreneurs also have a fairly high degree of uh, individualism, uh, which uh, sometimes is difficult to reconcile with uh, going public and having your company uh, listed on the stock exchange, which brings with it uh, a more formalized system of governance, of governance, full transparency of the accounts and so forth. So sometimes it has also been an inner obstacle that prevented growth, but certainly labor legislation and uh, the, the problems related to large public sector companies have been have been key. How do I see the industrial future of uh, uh, Italy? Well, uh, the, the negative is that for 15 years, the rate of growth of the Italian economy has been about one half the rate of growth of the Eurozone. And this was not really re sufficiently recognized at the time in Italy. And so there was the conviction that not much had to be done because, uh, after all, the standard of life was, was good, except that, to some extent, Italians were decumulating uh, from the stock of wealth. And this is not a sound position to be in. Now, uh, at the same time, when uh, one sees what Italian enterprises are doing elsewhere in the world. I uh, visited uh, Mr. Medvedev and Mr. Putin two weeks ago. Uh, the, the list of uh, major and, and, and smaller activities by Italian companies in Russia is amazing and growing. Uh, so I think uh, we um, have to act on making uh, Italy a more attractive uh, location to invest in, and also we have to act to remove some obstacles to the growth of Italian companies. Um, of course, uh, all we are trying to do in the area of uh, fiscal discipline and sustainability of public finance, including the pension reform, I should have said that if we, if one computes the hidden debt due to the servicing of the pensions obligations into a total figure of public sector debt, uh, Italy comes out uh, uh, as uh, certainly not being one of the most indebted countries in Europe. So all, all this work on, on the environment for the company, but then also uh, modernization of labor market uh, rules, which uh, we did uh, by, by giving much more freedom, uh, and I would say much more freedom from strict labor judgment procedures to Italian, to Italian to entrepreneurs working <coughs> today. Um, and also there, there, there has been a big problem for infrastructures and uh, the competitiveness of Italian companies is penalized uh, not only by the insufficient uh, uh, increase in productivity within the firm but also uh, by the insufficient increase in uh, uh, total factor productivity due to uh, insufficient infrastructures, high costs for that, uh, high cost for energy and so on and so forth. So it's, it's very much a work on the context in which companies operate. Uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, there to be uh, a, a, an industrial future of Italy and what about the South? Yes, I think that honestly Italy is one of the best placed countries in the world to uh, to generate uh, an economy like we will need in the next uh, decades, uh, where uh, the fruition of culture, of cultural goods, of nature, uh, of tourism, etc., become a key component of GDP. And uh, uh, Italy and the south of Italy in particular are very well located uh, to achieve this. And of course, with the notion of southern Italy 
a notion, another notion comes to the, to the mind that is uh, organized crime, uh, where I'm glad to say uh, the governments, the Italian governments in the last several years, so this is not a merit <laughs> exclusive or mainly for the, this current government, uh, have achieved a very remarkable success uh, in terms of control against uh, organized uh, crime. On that mutualization, um, well, this is really linked to a third question, um, political union. Um, I think it's only natural that uh, uh, if, there, if there is to be some mutualization of debt, there has to be, and there I agree uh, totally with Chancellor Merkel, there has to be a, a mutualization of, of policy control, that is, political union. Um, and uh, uh, I think we are more advanced in that than we normally believe. In particular, I think uh, uh, the innovation introduced last year for the first time and much more fully exercised this year, namely the European semester and the fact that, that each member state has to submit its draft budget for the following year to Brussels, even before submitting it to national parliaments, I think uh, may raise eyebrows with national parliaments, but is certainly a very concrete measure of uh, not political union, but uh, of uh, fiscal policy on the way to a union, because it's really a much greater centralized control. Um, uh, but I, uh, I think that looking at the issue of eurobonds or debt mutualization just uh, on, uh, on the basis of an effort by indebted countries to persuade uh, uh, other countries to take a part of the burden which will come only if there is uh, adequate central uh, control or political union, that is one part. But I think there is also a, a set of market arguments for eurobonds uh, namely how to exploit the huge potential of what is potentially the largest, by far, government debt market in the world, which, however, at this stage does not make use to, of, of its uh, uh, potential economies of scale, etc. So, uh, uh, although uh, we, we have a, a lot of uh, stocks and flows of government uh, securities in Europe in terms of a united, uh, liquid, transparent uh, market. Uh, uh, we are much less advanced than the US or, or Japan. So this is a problem which goes under the heading single market if you, if you want. But I think it is important not to create unnecessary conflicts uh, among uh, uh, policy leaders uh, of different countries. Uh, and therefore, uh, I uh, stress again that Italy is strongly in favor of Eurobonds, uh, and that at the same time, uh, the Italian government realizes that that step can be taken only when other steps will have been Taken. And finally, on uh, strengthening political union, what could be concretely done? Well, I think we have to do uh, uh, contents and, and uh, process. Uh, in, in terms of contents, uh, this uh, uh, gaining of control to a large extent uh, by all of us collectively in the European Union on each individual country's budget <coughs> is already a step in the right direction. But, uh, and I agree very much with uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tillikainen, uh, we have to uh, enhance uh, uh, visible democratic instruments uh, um, to, to have a, a, a substantive political uh, union. Uh, I would have only one uh, question, if I may, or, or a caveat. 
I, I, I followed uh, with, with great interest your, your remarks. Uh, implicit in your suggestion uh, for a uh, political government for Europe, the Commission uh, of a greater role of the European Parliament and all that is, uh, I think, the idea that uh, we should aim at making uh, the EU level political system more similar to the political systems that we have at home in each of our countries. And I see the attractiveness of that argument. But reflecting on democracy in Europe at large, I wonder whether national democracies, with all due respect, are still a model, or whether much of the political problems at the EU level are not uh, perhaps the implication of a certain malfunctioning of uh, political systems at the national level. I'm not pleading for non-democratic systems at, uh, at, uh, the, uh, at the national level, but uh, certainly in many of our countries, and not only in Europe for that matter, mm -hmm. we see a, a gradual uh, shortening of the uh, time horizon considered by politicians, short-termism. Uh, and uh, we see a growing uh, intellectual isolationism, um, the, uh, the return to nationalistic perspectives, the, the, which brings with it uh, uh, populism and uh, pleading for integration, which is more and more necessary is of course a highly difficult and sophisticated uh, political reasoning, probably the one which it is mo most difficult to conduct uh, in, in a political system where what matters is the effect of what you are saying uh, on the next elections, uh, uh, maybe a, a few months down, down the road. So I am very attracted by the idea, let's make Europe more similar to our traditional political systems, provided there is a footnote. Let's also reflect on whether our own traditional systems uh, work. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Uh, we will continue with, with questions. Uh, now we'll take the question of Eero Wobula. I was formerly serving at the, the Commission under your, your authority. My question relates to uh, uh, the Italian domestic political scene. We are all impressed by the bold measures uh, concerning pension age and other structural uh, reforms. Uh, now, I would like to ask at which Base, these reforms will be implemented and how will it affect the Italian political scene prior to next uh, general elections? Will the consensus between the three major parties remain or, or, or will, we, will we see the return of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, your, your predecessor who damaged a little bit the Italian reputation? here in the north. Thank you. Thank you. Right on, Prime Minister. Uh, I think this crisis lasted too long, and I think the reason is that we do too little too late. And uh, the question of interest rates is very interesting. As you rightly said, the market slipped from 1997 to 2008. The interest rate were too low, not reflecting the risk of the countries. And I r rightly agree that today they even to a certain degree uh, overreact, <coughs> overreact. However, can't we see that high interest rates are a good thing because they force countries to reforms? If I may take an example of Finland in 1991-93, our gross national product dropped by 13.5% and we had to deep, uh, uh, execute such deep cuts in spending, austerity measures, that actually no country in Europe has still today, maybe Greece, done anything like that. 
With that consequence, that Finland became the most competitive country in, by all measures in the whole world. So, in fact, when you make deep cuts, you are on solid ground, so then you get a spiral of growth. So, can't you see any good in high interest rates forcing the politicians to make decisions that are necessary? Thank you so much. Thank you. That's Charlie. So, Mr. Charles von Wispasman, researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, one quick question. You mentioned financial markets, and quite rightly, uh, as Kimo Sassi pointed out, um, they have some work to do. Now, all of these, the financial markets are composed of actors, financial actors, all of whom work under some license or permission by European sovereign states. In your discussions with Prime Minister Kata and other European leaders, have you discussed ways which I don't know, let's say regulation should be reformed to increase transparency, improve stability, uh, and in some way, shall we say, make the markets um, a little more rational. Thank you. Thank you. We have, yes, please. I, I take one more. One more question. Uh, my name is Melipe Kaletto. My field is medicine, uh, far from economics and politics, but I'm pathologist, so I think I can say something about maladies. Uh, Euro or financial sector. But w what I would like to ask is in the spirit of Kimo Sassi's question. Uh, according to statistics, Italy has been in recession four times during its membership in EMU. So, uh, given all the blessings of, uh, of Euro, I mean, what have been the benefits of Euro, uh, given that there have been four times in recession in your country? And who has benefited? And could we see that in some ways the membership has been an obstacle or hindrance to growth of productivity, as mentioned? Thank you. Um, how should the politicians, the third question, I got in this uh, a lot, how should politicians uh, reform, shouldn't politicians reform uh, uh, regulatory policies so as to make markets more rational? Um, I think uh, they should and I think they are doing that to some extent both in the US and uh, in uh, in Europe, uh, so many initiatives have been taken uh, concerning uh, transparency, concerning uh, um, uh, regulatory oversight, um, concerning uh, the governance of financial institutions themselves, uh, concerning even uh, uh, competition and antitrust uh, in uh, financial markets and institutions uh, concerning uh, the rating agencies. So I think that uh, one cannot say that after the, the crisis, uh, regular public powers have not moved uh, uh, to make uh, financial markets uh, uh, less risky for the society uh, and more rational. Um, and, and I should also mention this discussion on the financial transaction tax, which uh, enters in this category. Uh, and uh, many of these reforms uh, uh, have uh, um, also aimed at reducing the degree of short-termism in the functioning of markets except that maybe, linking this to my previous point, there has been some contamination from the uh, object of the therapy markets, too much short-term in them, then to the doctors, the politicians, uh, who have uh, themselves taken an increasingly short-term uh, attitude. Uh, and sometimes you can see insufficient long-term perspective even in the management of discipline. Uh, 
maybe the stability compact number, uh, the stability uh, the, the stability and growth uh, pact number one uh, was uh, uh, characterized by stringent and rigorous verbal discipline, dry common rule. Uh, and at the first uh, 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 hitting of the reality, 2003, it broke down. So I think that there, there has to be also a degree of uh, uh, sustainability of the ambition to enforce discipline. We should be as stringent as possible, but uh, uh, as stringent as uh, uh, realistically possible, not to excite ourselves uh, because we are a, a, a exceedingly, uh, totally uh, rigorous and adamant in putting in place something that after one year or two years, uh, maybe in the face of a recession, will, uh, will, will not be sustainable. Closed parenthesis. Um, the so the short answer to the third question on making markets more rational is uh, yes, they should, and I think they are uh, to some uh, extent. Uh, on uh, um, on the uh, question about. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the, at which pace uh, will the reforms in Italy take place and what about uh, what comes next, uh, what will be the behavior of the three parties uh, with the elections and after the elections. Well, we, we had to proceed at a very, very accelerated and concentrated pace. Uh, why? Because of the reason that uh, the fourth and last question uh, put forward, namely, what were the benefits that Italy got from the Euro if it had several recessions? I think Italy got huge benefits from, from the Euro. And I would say that uh, the apparatus for discipline imposed uh, to participate in the Euro was one of these key benefits. Uh, but also the predictability and, and all that. Except that Italy, like some other countries, once achieved the big objective of entering the Euro since day one, uh, did not uh, put uh, equal emphasis and determination in uh, achieving the necessary accompanying conditions that was the structural reforms to become competitive in a context where it would no longer be possible to devaluate periodically. And uh, like other countries, uh, Italy found uh, the Lisbon strategy inaugurated in 2000 by the EU um, a little soft, it was not incisive enough, and uh, uh, therefore no progress was achieved, uh, no sufficient progress in terms of the structural reforms, and here we are now uh, that we had in eight months to put together a number of reforms that normally take much longer. Now, about the elections, um, I don't know, I am confident that uh, <coughs> the political parties uh, will have in the meantime reflected on the gap that was created over the last several years between uh, citizens and political parties in terms of perception and credibility. And I hope they have been working hard using this parenthesis provided by the so-called technical government in order to uh, improve their own uh, life. And I hope that they will soon reach an agreement on a new electoral law which uh, will also help give new credibility to the political system. And very final uh, point, uh, Mr. Sazi, don't interest rates, uh, aren't interest rates, uh, uh, high interest rates after all a good thing because they put uh, pressure and you gave the example of Finland. Um, to some extent, yes, I agree with you. Um, 
At the same time, relative to that situation of Finland, uh, I think there are two differences now. One is that uh, high interest rates are no longer the single form of, of pressure for good policy making because, especially in the Eurozone, we are now under a, a, a tight network of uh, uh, recommendations, constraints, uh, um, etc. Take the case of Italy. Uh, now Italy is uh, complying with each and every country-specific recommendation issued by the EU. So one could argue, I cannot be a neutral observer, of course, but one could perhaps argue that uh, the good policies have been put in place Otherwise, we will be pursued by the EU, and we are not. And yet, uh, actually, interest rates now in Italy are far higher than they were in all the first uh, seven or eight months of 2011, uh, when the unanimous agreement was that uh, the Italian government was not putting up the right policies. There, the average in that period, the average spread of the German Bund was uh, 180 basis points. Now it is 460 basis points. And uh, the second difference relative to the situation you refer to of Finland is that uh, at this time, the spread, that you cannot imagine how uh, conversant any taxi driver in Italy has become on the spread. Uh, how much talk about uh, how is the spread uh, today uh, goes on uh, in Italian supermarkets uh, and it has become the daily, no I should say hourly, uh, grading of uh, whether a government does well or poorly. Um, and uh, if uh, for some reasons where the markets uh, are un, uh, uncertain about the overall sustainability of the euro, uh, this determines in the countries which have a higher inherited debt, a very high spread, uh, this is uh, a recipe not for good economic policies but for exactly the opposite, because I can assure you that if the spread in Italy remains at these levels for some time, I would keep some mystery, some time, uh, but, but then, uh, then uh, you are going to see a, a non-EU oriented, non-Euro oriented, non-fiscal discipline oriented government uh, taking power in, in Italy. So in that case, we will have to consider retrospectively that uh, what a pity that for 10 years markets went to sleep and did not have the creation of good policies then when the good policies were in place, because in the meantime the EU had more teeth, uh, the uh, excitement daily and nightly of the financial markets uh, threw away the governments which were diligently complying with the good policies. There is uh, some scope for reflection there. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a couple of brief uh, questions still, and then we have to, to draw the line. Ambassador here for the yeah. I take four more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank first for the organizers for organizing this, uh, conducting this meeting today. It's, it's really interesting. The debate is really great, so it gives also us diplomats a very good basis to report back to the capitals. Um, it seems now that the key question is the growth, how to create the growth, because only growth can pull us out of the current problems. And uh, if I'm right, I just read recently the, the column of uh, famous Noriel Rubini, uh, American economist who has 
predicted actually the crisis, financial crisis in, in 2008. And he's saying next year the perfect storm is coming. And he was, I think, uh, uh, talking about the global economy, including the European economy. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you have uh, indicated a few parameters how to create the growth, to strengthen the internal market, to create a common digital market, which would, uh, some figures are showing, 4 would contribute 4% to the overall growth in Europe. Uh, I would ask you, I know that you don't have a crystal ball to say, but uh, what do you think for the next year? Will Europe uh, create, uh, so to say, a sustainable level of growth to pull ourselves at least out of this crisis or this negative spiral will continue. So it's almost uh, negative growth all the time. Thank you. Thank you. We take uh, Mr. Wilhelmsson, Rector Wilhelmsson from the University of Helsinki. Hello, Prime Minister. I would like to continue from the, from the previous question and ask you about uh, what is your opinion on, on, on the kind of the basis of, of European competitiveness in the future compared to, to, to the US and Chinese economies. I think there's some contradicting signals coming through Europe now. On the one hand, we have the bold strategies and plans for an innovative European, European economy where, where much emphasis is based on innovation, education, kind of these things which, 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 which would be the central drivers of European economy. At the same time, time we see, in particular in Southern Europe, rather dramatic cuts in education, research, research funding and so, so on. And, and we see some reflections of, of, of that in, even in, in our, our country. How, what is your, your view on, on, on the role of research, education, innovation as drivers of European economy? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, my question concerns uh, the European Central Bank's uh, mandate. Uh, the, the European Central Bank Governing Council members have referred to, to their actions being or taken within their uh, legal mandate and, and uh, within the confines of that mandate. And recently we had, uh, uh, for example, the Bundesbank uh, reminded that the ECB should stay within its mandate, which is price stability. At the same time, we have uh, both a lot of, of uh, external and internal pressures for the ECB to do more and, and perhaps even, uh, in some view, uh, go beyond uh, what it is doing now and go beyond uh, from, from something this perspective, uh, it's current mandate. In your personal opinion, do you think that in the future, in order to get us through this crisis, the current uh, European Central Bank mandate is sufficient? Thank you. Uh, to dispose quickly of the last question, which is uh, much too timely, because at this time, the board of the ECB is, I guess, uh, the sitting in meeting in Frankfurt. Uh, so I will uh, uh, respectfully observe the silence. <laughs> um, um, the ambassador, first of all, you alarmed me when you said that uh, conferences like this one are very useful because uh, ambassadors can report back home. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I said uh, to myself, uh, what will the Italian ambassador report maybe? <laughs> <laughs> maybe the Italian prime minister back home will discover that I said something <laughs> inappropriate. Um, the um, the Why did I write 1981? No, I was referring to Noriel Rubin. Ah, yes, yes. Economist who predicted yes, yes, forecast. yes. No, uh, you, you said the, the famous American economist. Uh, I am a great admirer of his. 
uh, and he graduated with me at Bocconi University in 1981. And I, I, I often uh, said to him, and also in public, uh, that uh, the fact that he prepared with me his uh, thesis on the vicious circle between uh, exchange rate depreciation, um, inflation, and wage indexation, which was in place in Italy at that time, trained him particularly well uh, to be able to cope with the complexities of the, the world economy a few decades later. Yes, um, he, uh, he, he is concerned, and, uh, he, and his concerns <laughs> since a few years are taken very seriously um, by everybody. Um, I, uh, I think uh, if, if I uh, have to uh, go essentially to the perspective for growth of Europe, to save time, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not pessimistic at all about uh, the uh, prospects for growth, uh, uh, even though we are all aware of the uh, difficulties. But uh, to me, uh, when uh, we will be 10 years from now, and we will look back uh, at the period between uh, 1995 and uh, 2015, we will discover that those 20 years were years in which indeed Europe's growth was inferior to the growth of other parts of the world. Except that uh, growth was not the main item on the agenda of Europe, whereas it was for America, for China, for others. No, no, much of the time, intellect, uh, energies of uh, policymakers in Europe during those 20 years was absorbed by doing something else and something hugely more important than growth, <laughs> namely constructing Europe. Uh, constructing Europe. And uh, at the beginning of that period, uh, uh, Europe was lacking four things that uh, the US had been having uh, since more than two centuries. A single market, a single currency, <coughs> enlargement uh, to the West uh, in their sense, to the East in our sense, and the Constitution. Now, in, in 20 years, which is a, an extremely quick moment of history, we got three and a half of those four. Single market, more or less well functioning, uh, the single currency, very well functioning, um, the enlargement, in our case to the East, and demand driven, not to the West, and cowboy pushed. And, uh, and uh, we almost got a constitution. The, the, the one half is the Lisbon Treaty relative to a fully fledged constitution. So we lost time, uh, but to do something else. Is this something else irrelevant for growth in the future? No, I believe it's not irrelevant. And especially now, this putting up a better governance for the Economic and Monetary Union will not be irrelevant for growth. So, of course, we remain with the problems of technology, flexibility of markets, and all that, and we have to do much, much more. And uh, to capture a, a, key, a key message uh, from uh, Mr. Johnson's remarks, uh, uh, recognition of the central role of enterprise has to permeate much more than, so far, the policy agendas. But uh, I think Europe will, of course, be a shrinking part of the global uh, GDP because of demographic and other reasons. But in my fairly optimistic view, uh, it will be able to re-trigger growth 
and that will be the uh, entity which uh, uh, once uh, having recovered a reasonable degree of self-assurance uh, will uh, largely help the other and more economically powerful parts of the world to have a clue on how to organize world governance or the governance of globalization because this is what Europe has been successfully doing for 60 years on the European continent. And very last remark, uh, basis for EU competitiveness and growth in the future, uh, uh, research, education and innovation and do I have any comments on Finland in that respect? Well, I think uh, this is really the key. This is really the key. And uh, to me, the two messages that I bring home every time I think of Finland or I visit Finland are number one, and this is not uh, very liked uh, by the Finnish British community, uh, business community. Mm -hmm. uh, high taxes are not a good thing in themselves, but they are not necessarily the evil. It much depends on what the government does with the revenue of the taxes, and I think uh, Finland has done and is doing better than others in this respect. And the second point, your research, yes, but also your education, including primary education uh, system, is something that uh, should really be admired. And uh, what uh, uh, strikes me uh, very much is, if I understand the reality correctly, the high degree of social respectability and the high degree of pride of teachers, school teachers in the Finnish society. I don't know many countries where this uh, is true, and this is really the key to the future, including to economic growth. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. We finish like the positive remarks to the end. Uh, your openness has been very well received here this morning on behalf of the organizers, on behalf of this audience. I'd like to thank you again. Uh, may I ask the audience, uh, because of the logistics of this room, would you please remain seated while we will send our visitor away? He has a fight to catch. Thank you very much. I got a little bit that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>